Welcome to the next video in the Measure and Integration video series. And so we're again following this Wikiversity course page, talking about the motivations for inventing a new theory of integration. And so we just saw why Lebeg came, or you know, felt that it was useful to come up with a new theory of integration. We'll contrast that with Riemann integration. So I know that just a few videos ago, we already did a quick summary of Riemann integration but it's uh, useful to really get the highlights so that you can contrast it with what Lebeg does differently. And so let's emphasize the fact that the very first thing that you do in Riemann integration is to partition the domain, right? That is what we are going to contrast and do differently with Lebeg integration is that we won't first partition the domain, instead we'll first partition the range. But so for to continue with the summary of Riemann integration, we partition the domain, we use the partition to determine heights of rectangles, you know, we can choose the left edge, we can choose the right Right edge, we can choose the minimum, we can choose the maximum over each one of those partitions. But one way or another, we get heights. And then with the widths and heights thus determined, we get rectangle areas. And then in a sense, we take the limit as this procedure sends the size of the partitions to zero or whatever is your favorite way of thinking about what the limiting procedure is. But in any case, you know, the first three steps are a method of getting a particular uh, estimate for the area under the curve. And then we let the limit as that, you know, like we take some kind of a limiting procedure until it converges to precisely the area under the curve. Let's think about it in reference to this particular example where f of x is x squared plus one on the interval negative one to one. And let's think about particularly the partition containing the points negative one, zero, and one. So let's go ahead and represent the graph of this function to give us a sort of visual aid. Here it is in the upper right. And um, so we would like to mark on the horizontal axis the points of the partition. So those points are negative 1, 0, and 1. Now, just arbitrarily, I'm going to go ahead and choose left endpoints to determine the heights of the rectangles. That doesn't really matter, right? I could have chosen the minimum of the function over the interval or lots of other possibilities, but here I'll just uh, arbitrarily pick left endpoints. And you get these two rectangles, and so now we know the width and the height. If you sort of like shade in the area of these rectangles, then that sort of represents the calculation that we would do to multiply width times height and then add together all the areas of the rectangles. And that is the short picture of how Riemann integration works on that particular example. Let's move on to Lebesgue integration. And Lebesgue integration is going to reverse the order in which we, uh, you know, partition, in a sense, the domain and range or something like that. So this time we're going to partition the range. And so, you know, here in this example, we're going to use the same function as before. But let's imagine a partition with partition points 0, 1, 2. You can see that uh, below, that's that cursive P symbol. Uh, but we're also, and it, this is going to be useful in a minute, we're going to think about the partition more as intervals rather than as specific numbers. That's going to help for a few of the steps that we do later on. So in any case, so, so this time we're going to think about the partitions as intervals. And so we're going to take the interval from negative infinity up to zero, then the interval from zero to one, 1 to 2, 2 to infinity. Okay, so that's our new concept of a partition here. We'll draw the function again to give us a visual idea of, you know, what this all means. And, um, and so uh, let's go ahead and represent these intervals on the y-axis. So... Uh, the partition points are going to be on the vertical axis, the points 0, 1, and 2, and then we're going to have, you know, sort of talk about all of the intervals between and beyond these partition points. So let's start with this first partition cell, I guess you could call it, going from negative infinity up to 0. 
And what we're going to do is look for the pre-image of this interval you know, with the given function. So that is going to mean that we are looking for all points, right? Like these are Y axis points. We're gonna look for all of the X axis inputs to the function, which result in Y coordinates within this interval. Now you can see from the blue curve of the function that its Y values never enter that region. And therefore the pre-image of this interval is the empty set. But you know what you can kind of see is that like the you know we're still going to be using it you know it, you'll see it better later on when we actually get to draw some more interesting pictures but um but eventually these y axis points are going to act like heights of rectangles in a certain sort of way and the pre-images are going to act like intervals along the x-axis and those are going to be like widths of rectangles in a certain sort of way uh, so, you know, it's very similar. The main difference is that we're partitioning the vertical axis first rather than the horizontal axis. But let's move on to the next interval. So uh, in the next interval, we're going to take it from 0 to 1, 0 exclusive, 1 inclusive. You will not be surprised to learn that, you know, for, for almost every uh, situation, the inclusion or exclusion of a single point, just like with Riemann integration, does not change the end result. So, um, so don't worry too much about that. We'll talk about the technical details in obviously much more depth later, but right now we're just getting introduced to this. But I think you'll be, you know, right, like, okay, first of all, let's talk about the pre-image of this interval where it is exclusive on zero, inclusive on one. Only the number X uh, equal to zero will map into that range. You can see that that, you know, the, the only Y coordinate of the graph of the function containing a Y coordinate in that interval is the point zero one. So you get the X coordinate uh, zero in the pre-image on that interval. I hope that's clear. But okay, let, let's just uh, keep going. Let's do this again on the next interval from one to two, exclusive on one, inclusive on two. Much more interesting stuff is gonna happen on this interval because again, we're looking for the X coordinates that send F into, right, the Y values into this range. There's gonna be many more of them this time. And probably the easiest way to determine, like, what are all of the X coordinates that map into this interval of Y values? And so uh, a, a relatively easy way to do that is to just sort of draw this horizontal line for all of the points where Y is equal to two, and especially be interested in where the function intersects this uh, line. But, uh, you know, uh, and then also do likewise at the bottom of the interval. So that would be like uh, all you know, drawing the line where y is equal to one. And in between those, you see all the points of the function. And you can see that, you know, the, uh, the function reaches two at the left edge where x is equal to negative one. That makes sense also if you just plug negative one into the function because, you know, uh, f of negative one is equal to two. So it's mapped into that interval. Um, keep in mind, though, that it does not include zero, right? Or sorry, uh, well, it, the X value zero is not included because that gets you one and one is not included in this uh, interval of Y values. So we have to go from negative one inclusive to zero exclusive. I'm going to now write the uh, disjoint union symbol, that's that square union, that is just like the regular union, it's just written as a square, as like a signal or a flag to tell you that the two sets are disjoint. So if you're unfamiliar with it, don't worry about it, it's just the regular union, it just has a little stylistic thing to remind you that these sets are disjoint, and that you will see later on is actually extremely important, but for now, just think of it as a regular union, if, if you, if you uh, are at all confused by it. But anyway, so we take the union of that together with the interval exclusive on zero, inclusive on one, and there is the pre-image of one to two. Okay. Now, Actually, technically, uh, you know, I've driv drawn like the entire function, but this is supposed to be still restricted from one negative one to one. And so those uh, 
you know, tails there are a bit of a lie. So let's just ignore them. And now when we compute, right, now that we are restricted to the interval from negative one to one, and we compute the pre-image of two to infinity, then that contains no points at all and therefore is the empty set. Okay, we have now computed all of the pre-images, and so you can see in the web page here that uh, you know we argued that the pre-image of negative infinity to zero was the empty set, and that is confirmed here from the web page. E2 is the set of just zero, and that is again confirmed, and so on. The next thing to do, because these are all supposed to be like rectangles, right? So, oh, and by the way, I guess we're gonna pick the minimum, or the actually the infimum, of each one of these vertical intervals to be like the height of the rectangle. Now on the first interval, that's maybe a little worrying because we would have to say that the height of these rectangles is negative infinity. But that's going to end up not mattering because the width of the intervals is uh, uh, the empty right like it's basically zero so we're just going to call that whole collection of rectangles an area zero so the fact that the height is negative infinity is not uh, terribly threatening because the width is zero and we're just going to say that that contributes zero area to the total area under the curve but again, right, but the idea is that, you know, we're going to we're going to take underestimates by choosing the minimum of the height in the interval. Right. So if the interval spans from, say, one to two, or we're really going to take the infimum of that, which is one and call the rectangle height one. Right. The infimum of the Y values is going to give us the height. But then we have to measure these pre-images to get us the width, right? Those are intervals or, or sets of X values uh, running horizontally and their length or really their measure is going to be what we call the width of the triangle. So, okay, so we now have to measure these things. Okay, and so we've said that the measure of the empty set is zero. The measure of a singleton of just zero is zero, right? So, so both of these sets have width zero, right? For E1 and E2, as you see them here, uh, you know, one of them has uh, width equal to zero because it is the empty set. The other one has width equal to zero because it's just a single point. I claim that that's pretty intuitive. We'll discuss this, of course, with much more rigor in the future. I mean, by the way, you know, the measure of these sets, that is the origin of measure theory, right? Talking about these measures is precisely what we are talking about when we talk about measure theory. So that's where the whole subject comes from, is trying to do precisely this job of measuring the pre-images of these sets in Lebesgue integration. But let's uh, let's move on to the next one. So this is the interval from one to two. We're taking its pre-image and measuring that. Now notice that the pre-image is the disjoint union of the interval from negative one to zero together with zero to one. What is the measure of each component? The measure of the first component from negative one to zero is clearly one. The measure of the second component is zero to one, which has a length of one. So I think pretty clearly each one has a measure of one. And when you take the disjoint union of them, then the combined measure is one plus one, which is two. So that is why the measure of this pre-image is two. And then for the final set, the E4, we again said that that, had, uh, that was the empty set. And so its measure is equal to zero. So let's kind of summarize and rehearse everything so far. First things first, you take a partition of the vertical axis and compute all of the pre-images of all of the intervals determined by the partition. Uh, so you try to compute what those pre-images are. And then next you measure all of the pre-images. Those are like rectangle widths. Uh, the infima 
of the function f on each one of those uh, pre -image. Oh, and by the way, we use the little lambda symbol to represent the measure of the set, right? So lambda of E1 is the measure of E1. And like we said, uh, that is equal to zero. So um, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that, I guess, later. But I think that's pretty clear and straightforward. But anyway, so yeah, we you know measure, we get all the pre-images, we measure each one. Those are the widths of the rectangles. And then to get the heights, we take the infimum. It doesn't have to be the infimum. I chose that arbitrarily. You could take the supremum or you know other options are also possible. But the point is that you get the heights of the rectangles from the partitions. And then you know you put the width and the height together to get a rectangle and you do it again and again and it all combines to a particular uh, approximation of the area underneath the curve and if the infimum ever does not exist for whatever reason either because the set was uh, empty or because uh, it was unbounded below or something like that then we just say that the um, uh, that the, the area that it contributes is zero. Um, and so let's just take a uh, kind of quick overview again, right now that we've seen it in a little bit of detail, what we're trying to do here, let's summarize the steps of Lebesgue integration, right? Form a partition, use the partition to determine pre-images of each cell, then get the, so to speak, length of each of the pre-images, which will serve as a rectangle width, and we should emphasize that this step three is the thing that is actually leads to measure theory, right? I mean, coming up with a consistent, you know, way of taking any, you know, cause like these, these pre-images here, they were pretty straightforward and simple, but in general, you'll find that they can get really, really wild. And so what we need to do is we need to invent a measure theory so that for any given set of real numbers, we can assign to it some concept of its width. Now, okay, I just lied to you ever so slightly. Um, and and we will dig deeply into exactly how I just lied to you, but don't worry about it too much. But you know, it's it's going to end up that we can't actually assign a measure to every possible set of real numbers, but we can get so close to it that uh, for all practical purposes, it's it's fine. But but I just want to emphasize that this step three is the real doozy. Uh, four, five, six, those are very straightforward. Once you get the measures of those widths, everything else runs you know kind of downhill very smoothly from there. But measure theory has its origins in finding the measures of those pre-images and so on. And so to give a quick preview of what uh, the measure theory content of this course is going to be, we find a rigorous system of measuring sets of real numbers. We use this system to apply it to what we just discussed as the new theory of integration. We show how somehow miraculously this new system of integration, you know, pretty much just by switching from partitioning the domain to the range, solves all the problems that we saw with Fourier analysis and switching limit and integral. But anyway, then we move on to seeing how this interacts with differentiation and then how this generalizes to more abstract spaces and measuring distances of functions and so on. And that gets us into LP spaces and, and so on. But that is the rough outline for the future.